Item number SCP-221 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-221 is to be kept in a locked container where it cannot be removed, except for further testing by Security Clearance Level 2 personnel. The container is a 15.25 cm by 15.25 cm steel box with a cushioned interior and with an internal locking system. The container is to be placed in a locked room with a guard to ensure that SCP-221 is not taken. Description SCP-221 is a pair of tweezers made out of gold, made in the 16th or 17th century. After subject testing, it was noted that the damaged areas which had been used to gather material samples were smaller than they had been prior to the test. It is currently theorized that SCP-221 uses the minute amounts of gold in the human body to regenerate damage to itself. Subject testing revealed that SCP-221 creates a highly focused case of obsessive-compulsive disorder in any person which uses it on their own body. Subjects will utilize SCP-221 to slowly remove any and all hair from their body before removing finger and toenails, as well as teeth, culminating with the removal of organs, both the external, such as the eyes and skin, and the internal, such as the liver and pancreas using their hands if SCP-221 is not effective enough, though SCP-221 will never be set aside during this process and remains gripped in one of the subject's hands. If SCP-221 is taken away from the subject, they become violent and manic and will use their hands to continue the process, albeit in a less careful manner. It is to be noted that the progression of this behavior is different for each subject, but no less fatal. SCP-221 came into Foundation possession after reports of a human being who was data expunged. Foundation personnel retrieved SCP-221 within 10 hours of the original report. Addendum Test Log 221-1 The test subject, a Class D, was ordered to use SCP-221 to remove his eyebrow hair. While the subject was initially unenthusiastic about this task, after the first 10 minutes, he began to more actively pluck out his own eyebrow hair, and after completely denuding his brow, moved on to plucking out his eyelashes, despite repeated assertions that the test was over. When released after SCP-221 was taken out of the room, he began to pluck out his eyelashes with his own fingers, completely removing all of them before moving on to his toenails. The subject completely removed his toe and fingernails, before yelling and smashing his own face against a wall. The reason for this outburst became apparent when he reached into his mouth and began ripping out his now loosened teeth. Eventually, the subject died from blood loss and shock, halfway through the task of pulling out his own internal organs. Test Log 221-2 The test subjects were two Class D personnel. Test Subject 1, ordered to use SCP-221 on the other Class D. Test Subject 2 After 15 minutes, the test subjects began to argue about how the holder of SCP-221 was using it on the other. The test subjects began to fight for use of SCP-221. Test Subject 1 used SCP-221 to stab Test Subject 2 through the eye, piercing into the brain, immediately killing him. Test Subject 1 then began to use SCP-221 to remove his own eyelashes, continuing then to his teeth and eyes. Test Subject 1 died of blood loss after removing 73% of the skin on his body. Item Number SCP-305 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-305 is presently immobile. Site-305 has been constructed around its present location, a wooded canyon near and is staffed by at least seven personnel who have prior experience with SCP-305 and proved resistant to its effects. The remainder of the station crew should be rotated on a weekly basis. SCP-305's effect grows weaker if human subjects are exposed to it for extended periods of time. Therefore, a resistant subject should be exposed to it for at least three hours daily. SCP-305's effects are greatly magnified in individuals with feelings of guilt, particularly over crimes, or mental instability. 
Therefore, Site 305 is staffed exclusively by non D class researchers and agents who are screened for criminal records and mental instability. Any personnel who begin to hear whispered compliments must be transferred out immediately. If symptoms persist after removal, frontal lobotomy data expunged. The actual containment chamber of SCP-305 is constructed of standard materials and offset from the rest of the station by a 5-meter buffer zone to protect normal staff from the worst of SCP-305's effects. Site-305 broadcasts a constant status normal signal to Site-19. If Site-305 becomes compromised during a containment breach, this signal will cease and a heavily armed containment team will immediately be dispatched to the location. Instances of SCP-3051 are extremely dangerous and should be terminated on site without attempting containment. As of 2000, all attempts to extract samples from SCP-3055 for study are forbidden. Description SCP-3055 is a rock formation of approximately humanoid size and shape. Remote recordings of SCP-305 show that it remains stationary at all times, even when interacting with human subjects. When viewed by a sentient observer, SCP-305 appears to be a mobile, animate humanoid of indeterminate sex. This manifestation is formed of cracked rock, similar to SCP-305's physical form, and while it is faceless, Subjects report that the cracks all over SCP-305's surface begin to resemble human lips and ears as it moves. Human subjects who make visual contact with this manifestation hear whispering voices. Although recording equipment in the area picks up nothing, and the phenomenon is observed even in subjects who are deaf from birth, SCP-305 will initially ingratiate itself with the subject by whispering compliments. During this phase, the subject experiences feelings of friendliness and trust towards SCP-305. These sensations seem unrelated to the actual content of the compliments, which ranges from off to nonsensical and disturbing. A short list of reported compliments is included. You have beautiful eye sockets. Every one of your fingers. Your neck appears unusually flexible. In the second phase, the subject begins to hear many voices emanating from SCP-305. At this point, the whispers become critical, attempting to insult the subject or undermine the subject's self-esteem, especially by playing on the subject's guilty conscience. Like the compliments, these insults make little sense when recounted, but have a profound psychological effect, driving the subject to suicide before the final phase in 20% of cases. If the subject is removed from SCP-305's presence during Phase 2, the subject will hallucinate that these insults are emanating from mouth-like cracks that appear to form on the ground, walls, and ceiling. In the third and final phase, the voices will abruptly stop. Two to ten hours from the cessation of hallucinations, SCP-305's humanoid manifestation will appear and kill the subject. Causes of death are varied, but include severe cardiac infarct, muscle spasm leading to severing of the spinal column, diaphragm paralysis, and a subject who dies of any cause after the beginning of the second phase, data expunged, followed by the emergence of an instance of SCP-3051 from the corpse. SCP-3051 are humanoids, slightly smaller than SCP-305 itself. Unlike SCP-305, SCP-3051 seem to be made of a smooth, hard white substance, and the lips and mouths on their surfaces are extremely lifelike. SCP-3051 have the same abilities as SCP-305, and although they are created with a very short range of 2 meters, this range increases exponentially over time. SCP-3051 move at 30 kilometers an hour and seem naturally drawn in a direct line towards the nearest densely populated area, presumably in an attempt to further propagate themselves. SCP-3051 are highly resistant to bullets and cutting weapons, 
Elimination teams should be equipped with heavy ballistics and explosives. In subjects who have entered Stage 2, manifestation of SCP-3051 can only be prevented by removal of 80% data expunged. Addendum 3051 On 2000 Foundation personnel used a remote-controlled device to extract a sample of SCP-305's rock structure. SCP-305 began to emit loud grinding noises and a low growling sound. Existing cracks in the rock formation deepened, and several new ones formed in the vicinity of the removed rock sample. SCP-305 then moved its arms upward slightly and slid one foot, about ten centimeters, across the ground as if taking a step, shedding rock fragments as it moved before returning to its stationary state. Following this event, the range of SCP-305 psychic influence tripled, resulting in several data expunged. Sample proved to be ordinary sedimentary rock, consistent with the surrounding area. Follow-up X-ray scans of the formation itself reveal the presence of suggesting that the rock formation may actually be an imprisoned instance of data expunged. Upgrade to Keter requested. Pending. Item Number SCP-330 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Considering Recent Incidents SCP-330 is to be kept in secure storage until further notice. Level 2 clearance is required for access to SCP-330, or its contents. All direct experimentation of SCP-330 is to be conducted using Class D personnel, with no genetic history of diabetes. No more than two samples are to be removed from SCP-330 at any time, except during exposure testing. Description SCP-330 appears to be a small, round, stainless steel bowl filled with a variable amount of individually wrapped pieces of candy. Taped to the side of the bowl is a handwritten note, reading, Take no more than two, please. Attempts to remove the note have met with failure, as have attempts to hide or obscure it. Testers have noted finding it impossible to avoid reading the note, and those who approach it from an opposite angle are aware of this request. When a quantity of candy greater than two pieces is removed, regardless of the means involved, the offender instantly has both hands severed at the wrists by an unknown method. Tests involving remote manipulation by Class D personnel resulted in the operator's hands being removed, despite no direct contact. Inspection of the incision reveals that the cut is made at a molecular level, leaving no tool marks or identifying factors. It is to be noted that the third piece must be removed within a certain time frame. After 24 hours, the count resets, and additional candy can be removed. Discovered three days after Halloween of 2000, when a police investigation into what was believed to be a case of ritualistic dismemberment was launched, SCP-330 was seized as evidence, but all attending officers were killed after Officer emptied the bowl of its contents. The cause of death was a result of data expunged. Foundation agents, under the guise of federal agents, recovered the object with acceptable casualties. Addendum Due to continuing security issues, SCP-330 will be held in Dr. Kondraki's office when not required for testing. Experiment Name Researcher Vogt Date Undisclosed Subject D-33001, a double amputee equipped with prosthetic forearms and hands, was told to remove three pieces of candy from the bowl. Subject complied, with no immediate effects. However, within 45 seconds, subject reported a burning itch from both his arm stumps, right arm, 2 centimeters below elbow, left arm, 1.5 centimeters below elbow, and phantom pains from both his absent wrists. Subject's distress at this discomfort increased rapidly. Within 180 seconds of having removed the third candy from the bowl, the subject began forcibly removing both his own prostheses. Upon hurling the prostheses to the ground, subject reported that the discomfort had ceased. Dermatological examination of subject's stumps revealed no unusual irritation or inflammation. 
Mechanical examination of subject's prostheses revealed that, in addition to the physical damage sustained by being hurled to the ground, the prostheses had data expunged. Subject was supplied with fresh prostheses, identical to the first pair, but reported feeling that it was wrong to put them on. Coercion was applied, and subject reluctantly put on left prosthesis. Note, subject is right-handed. However, when told to put on right prosthesis, subject began weeping incoherently and flailing his arms until the left prosthesis detached itself. Analysis of video footage revealed that subject had not properly attached the left prosthesis to his stump. Mechanical examination of left prosthesis revealed only physical damage sustained from being thrown across the room. 24 hours later, subject was given fresh prostheses and reported no difficulty in putting them on. Subject not terminated, as D-class amputees who are already used to their prostheses are in short supply. Item Number SCP-350 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures When not under experimentation, SCP-350 should be contained within a locked storage unit. No personnel other than those undergoing experimentation with SCP-350 should be allowed to sign SCP-350, no matter what might be offered in exchange. Those who have signed SCP-350 should be allowed to fulfill the terms of SCP-350 until the terms conflict with Foundation interests, at which point they should be restrained or terminated as necessary. Any staff member above Level 3 caught signing SCP-350 for any reason must be immediately terminated. Description SCP-350 appears to be a single-page contract, followed by 49 blank sheets. The contract outlines a basic exchange of a good or service, in exchange for a small amount of money wired to a numbered account at Bank in Zurich, Switzerland. The wording of SCP-350 is different to every reader prior to signature, and the good or service offered is always something the subject has expressed great desire to obtain. The document is also always in the native language of the reader, and conforms to the laws of the nation in which the subject makes their primary residence. Attempts to use video or photography to get an objective image of SCP-350 at this stage have failed, as the text continues to vary from person to person. Upon signing of SCP-350, the variable language property of the contract ceases, and the text of the contract stays in the language of the owner of the signature on the document to all readers. The subject will invariably find the object or proof of service shortly after exiting SCP-350's containment unit always in a location without direct surveillance. Should the signatory of SCP-350 fulfill the terms of the contract and wire the money to the bank account, SCP-350 begins to add new amendments and terms starting from the second page, most of which demand a minor service of some form from the signatory. However, the complexity of the terms and demands increases with the number of amendments fulfilled, eventually reaching extremes including but not limited to the murder of staff members, the removal of SCP-350 from Foundation containment, and even data expunged. Should the signatory not fulfill the original or new terms of SCP-350 for any reason for a full week, they will begin to feel a noticeable urge to complete the current task. This grows into a compulsion on the order of the ticks of those suffering from severe obsessive-compulsive disorder. Should the subject be prevented from completing the terms at this point, the subject will begin to lie, steal, kill, and take other extreme actions to attempt to fulfill the demands of the contract. Psychological analysis at this point reveals nothing, as the subject is utterly fixated on completing the task, to the exclusion of all else. If the subject is restrained from completing the task, the subject will resort to constant escape attempts, refusing to eat, drink, or sleep. Subjects will die unless placed on intravenous fluids and forced into a chemically induced coma. At this point, their metabolism and bodily functions will begin to speed up until the subject dies from either a heart attack or the inability of intravenous therapy equipment to keep up with the metabolism. Item Number SCP-382 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-3821 is to be stored in a standard site containment room inside a 1.5 by 1.5 by 1.5 meter plexiglass box of 5 centimeter thickness at minimum. A video camera is to be kept trained on it at all times, though this is merely for observational purposes. Due to the area of influence and deleterious nature of SCP-382's effect, it should only be removed from its enclosure for testing purposes, with staff observing from a remote location. No personnel, Class D or otherwise, should interact with SCP-3821 for more than two hours, unless accompanied by at least one armed agent. Description In its inactive state, SCP-3821 is a large baby carriage, manufactured in 19 by in England. Its age shows. Metal components are heavily rusted, the rubber of the tires is brittle, and the cushion is missing. SCP-3822 appears to be an infant, months old, extremely emaciated, with several injuries that seem to vary with each manifestation. On different occasions, SCP-3822 has shown heavy bruising, broken bones, and sometimes data expunged, despite which 3822 could still make vocalizations, although it is unknown how this was possible. When SCP-3821 is not being interacted with, SCP-3822 manifests every to minutes, staying between and minutes. However, when a person places their hands on the handlebars of the carriage, 3822 will instantly manifest, and the period of time of both disappearance and reappearance will decrease to approximately one second. Any person who makes visual contact with SCP-3821 from now on referred to as the subject, is compelled to approach it and place their hands on its handlebar. While manifesting only intermittently, SCP-3822 appears to compound the effect when the subject sees it. This effect does not transmit through video feeds, transparent objects, or anything else that would separate SCP-3821 and its victim. And once the subject is in contact with SCP-3821, no one else will be influenced until the subject has died and SCP-382 has reset. As soon as the subject comes into physical contact with SCP-3821 and SCP-3822 has manifested, they appear to enter a trance, in which they will propel SCP-3821 in a small circle and make noises directed at SCP-3822, apparently intended to be soothing. As time passes, the subject will begin to weaken, and their body will begin to degrade, while SCP-3821 slowly begins to take on a new, shinier appearance. Rust will begin to flake off, revealing shiny metal underneath. The rubber wheels will become more supple, and a velvet cushion will appear inside. At the same time, each successive manifestation of SCP-3822 will appear with fewer and fewer injuries, while looking less and less emaciated. The subject will continue to interact with SCP-382 up until just under two hours, at which point they will perish due to massive widespread organ failure. Once the subject has perished, SCP-3822 will disappear, and SCP-3821 will return to its former, derelict appearance within 30 minutes. Addendum 382A On Date Expunged my research team and I began testing to determine whether a person of sufficient youth and physical fitness could sustain interaction with SCP-382 past the two-hour mark. D-382-GTF-87I was chosen for his age, and because he had been a physical trainer prior to Data Expunged, and kept in shape throughout his incarceration at his exposure to SCP-382 proceeded as normal, though the physical degradation appeared to progress at a slower rate than previous test subjects. After the two-hour mark, with D-382-GTF-87I still living, though in extremely poor condition, SCP-3822 manifested as usual, but did not disappear one second later. SCP-3822 then data expunged, consuming the then mummified corpse of D-382-GTF-87I, and proceeded to data expunged. Fortunately, 
Only one other Class D was killed before SCP-3822 was terminated by Agent But the event has necessitated the amending of the SCP-3822 Special Containment Procedure somewhat. I don't feel that this warrants a change in classification level. Doctor Item Number SCP-395 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-395 is to be kept in the center of a locked room at least 10 meters wide. No female personnel are to be allowed into SCP-395's room, under any circumstances. The room is to be guarded by two male personnel at all times. Any unusual behavior should be reported immediately. Any independent movement on the part of SCP-395 should likewise be reported. SCP-395 is to be fed one liter of a half-and-half -half mixture of blood and milk, both taken from the same individual, once a week. Failing to follow a regular feeding schedule will cause SCP-395 to increase its range, at a rate of 10 meters per day without food. If it has not been fed for more than one week past its expected time, it will begin to... Description SCP-395 is a human fetus, approximately seven months into its development, contained in a specimen jar. The jar is filled with a standard formaldehyde solution, with traces of blood. When a female human comes within five meters of the jar, SCP-395 is able to telepathically influence her. At that point, the subject will feel a need to remove SCP-395 from its jar and allow it to feed in the normal manner. All women, regardless of age or medical status, will lactate under this telepathic inducement. Once the milk has been exhausted, SCP-395 will continue to feed, drawing blood and gnawing flesh from the subject. The subject apparently feels satisfaction throughout this process, only understanding what has actually happened when SCP-395 is sated and releases its control. SCP-395 was taken from a traveling freak show, whose owner had been using it to control women for his own personal use. It was discovered when police tracked the bodies of his victims back to him. One of the arresting officers fell under SCP-395's control and killed her partner when he attempted to stop her from removing it from its jar. Foundation agents caught the report from the follow-up investigation and acquired SCP-395. Interrogation of SCP-395's owner revealed little. He had acquired it along with the rest of the show from the previous owner's estate. Documentation included with the estate indicated that SCP-395 had been purchased from a teaching hospital in the early 1900s. No information regarding the parents was included. Testing by male personnel shows no detectable life signs while SCP-395 is inside the formaldehyde solution in its jar. Only when a female human subject comes within its range does it become active, exhibiting a faint heartbeat and high levels of brain activity. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.